Good morning, church. Good morning. This is Dana Ray Dittar. She is associate pastor what church? Auburn SDA Church. Auburn SDA Church in Auburn, California. How many of you know where Auburn, California is? How, do you, how many of you know that it's really close to a place that burnt to the ground recently? How many of you would think that if you were a, a youth group that you would want to go and help where the disaster happened? How many of you wanted to go and help up there? I know I did, but guess what? They're not letting anybody come in and help. So they chose a place as a school, Pine Hills Academy, uh, to come and help. And that place happens to be right here in the Southern California Conference known as, how many of you know where the Linda Vista Elementary School is? See, neither did I, except this week I went and I found it in one of the growing places in Southern California, a, uh, I think it's a riverbed. Yeah, That's basically. what it is. It's, it's, it's this, uh, how many of you know where Point Hunimi, how do we say it? Hoinimi. Hoinimi? Wainimi. Point Wainimi is. This school is fairly close to that alluvial plain that comes out, and when you drive through it there on 101, you see all that agriculture going on. Well, behind one of those housing developments in that area is an Adventist elementary school. Who knew? Well, I didn't. Until this week, when my friend Dana Ray and her group came down from Pine Hills Academy in Auburn, California, and spent the week with the principal. Just when the 7th and 8th grade teacher. 7th and 8th grade teacher as their guide to help do some things around that school. So if you want to join me right now as Southern California people, I'd like to thank these Northern California Conference people for coming down and helping us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pine Hills Academy. That was very, very kind of you. And it has dawned upon my consciousness that as an Adventist family in North America, we can help each other. Doesn't matter if it's one conference or two conferences over, we can work together on various projects that will push forward the kingdom of heaven in a particular area. Amen? Amen. So thank you for coming and doing that. Thank you ladies for singing for us today. I know that there were some injured on the job and we, we hope you will be uh, uh, well soon. And, and the guy who's hobbling around, he, uh, his ankle also gave out on him this week, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I asked when, when I knew that they were coming and Dana Ray said to me, I'd love for us, our kids, to come to your church because a little while ago, if you, some of you remember, I went to their school and did a week of prayer last, last fall and that was Dana Ray's invitation to me and, and so I know some of these kids from that time and um, uh, I said, well, turnabout's fair play, why don't I ask Dana Ray if she would team preach with me today as a fellow pastor and as a chaplain for this academy. So I said, Dana Ray, what, by the way, she doesn't go by Dana Ray, she goes by D. Ray, it's a lot cooler. Okay. It's my hipster name. It's your, it's your, it's your <laughs> high school name? My hipster name. Your hipster name. Yes. Your hipster name. Yes. Yeah, and she is a hipster. That is for sure. Um, what are you teaching these kids at school, and why did we have a text today from Micah and one from Revelation? Well, um, for the school year this year, we've been going through the book of Micah section by section and just kind of dis dissecting it together. And then at the church for Sabbath school, we've been going through Revelation, and there's just been so much crossover between the two. How many of you knew that there was crossover between the book of Micah and the book of Revelation? See? So it's good that you're bringing this to me. Yeah. Well, and one of those crossovers that we could look up is Micah chapter 4, verse five, one, 1 to 5. If we look that up, it says, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of them all, the most important on the earth, and will rise above over the hills. And the people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come to say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and the house of God. And there he will teach us his ways. And we will uh, walk in his paths. Um, sorry, lost my place. For the Lord is teaching 
The Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His words will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will meditate between his peoples, and we will settle between the strong nations far away. Their hammer and their swords, they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will no longer fight against nations, nor, uh, sorry, where am I? Nor will it, bottom of three. Oh, thank you. Nor will there be any more war. Everyone will live in peace and prosperity and enjoy their grapevines and their fig trees, for there will be nothing more to fear. The Lord of heaven's army has made this promise. And as we look at Revelation, that's really the whole point of Revelation, is it not? That God has given us this promise. Well, let's ask them, did you see anything in this passage at the beginning, class, What did you see right in the first verse that might match up with something that you've seen in the first part of Revelation? In the last days, the mountain of the Lord. Lord. Is is that not something that you see in Revelation chapter 4? Where you go up to the throne of God and that the throne scene in Revelation 4 is high and lifted up. It is on the mountain of the Lord. Okay, and then if you look into Revel, uh, no, Micah 5, verse 2 to 4, I'll just give you a moment to find it. This is a very technically advanced congregation. A lot of you are looking on your phones, I know right now. Thank you very much for having Bible Gateway on your phones. If you didn't know that that was an app that you can have, have Bible Gateway on your phone. Then you can find anything, anything, okay? So go ahead. Okay. Micah 5. Chapter of verse 2, sorry. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among the people of Judah, yet a, ru- uh, yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are of distant paths, will come from you on my behalf. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then, at last, his f- uh, fellow countrymen will return from exile in their own land, and they will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And then his people will live in there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world, and he will be the source of peace. Amen. It is, it is of great interest to me that she has chosen that we look at both of these things in, in school She has two different classes, right? And in one class, they're studying Micah, and in the other class, they're studying Revelation. And those who have been studying Revelation for the adult Bible study will probably be very well suited to taking what you have been learning in Revelation and also then looking for what is happening in Micah. If you look at what we just read in chapter 5, you will see again that this is a situation. I I just picked up in verse 3, Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth. Is that a picture that you see in Revelation at all? Anyone? Where do we see this picture? Revelation chapter 12. We have a beautiful lady. She's about to give birth. And who is waiting to devour her child? The dragon. Okay, so are you... Are you seeing a correlation here between what one prophet, and you could say another prophet, is seeing at the same time? You're seeing, therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. You have a picture that is one continuous thing from the time of the prophets of old to the time when John is given a vision in Revelation the vision of Jesus Christ, we can see that there is correlation between the two. We cannot think that uh, there is a separation. And and I want to emphasize this because these days, uh, and and D-Ray, you may may have heard some of this stuff too, but but, uh, these days there are individuals, famous, I'm going to call them name brand preachers, who are saying, we don't need the Old Testament as Christians. We don't need the Old Testament. We just need the New Testament that has only one commandment in it, 
for us, and that is that we should love one another. I'm here to tell you, in this study, I think we can already see this morning that the same story is being told not only by the prophets of old, but also by John the Revelator. Mm -hmm. So as we've been exploring Micah, mainly at the school, um, there's kind of just this overarching theme that just seems to take over. And it's, it's kind of like the tone in which Mike is talking. In some ways, he's angry with Israel, right? For the dysfunction that is going on. And so in some ways, it's kind of like a warning. And it can be kind of overwhelming and fearful. And our students really experience this because the first few chapters of Micah are really just really depressing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's going through all the atrocities that are going on in Israel, atrocities and practices that they've picked up from the countries around them. And this, this, this nation that was called out to be different, to be set apart and to have this message of hope forgot it. And then as we look into Micah chapter 6, Micah chapter 6, we can start um, right almost at the beginning. We really get that real tone of what's actually going on. It's not like a warning, like, you know, sometimes we get that warning of, as children, it's like, oh, if you do this, you're going to be going to your room, right? And this warning of impending punishment but in Micah chapter 6, we really get a taste for what God's tone really actually is. It says, stand up and plead your case to me. The mountains and the hills will be called to your witness and your complaints. The people are complaining against God. This is God talking here, and they're complaining. And now, O oh mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a complaint against his people. He will bring a charge against them. And in verse 3, I really, really get it. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Hmm. Answer me. Hmm. And so in the midst of all this stuff that kind of makes us a little nervous about the wrath of God, in a sense, we really see God's heart here. And it's not so much that he's promising to this judgment, promising uh, correction. He's really pleading with us. He's really pleading with Israel and their position. It's, what have I done that makes you not like me? And he goes on to list some of the things that he's done for Israel, things that they had all forgotten about because they weren't there anymore. This is generations past. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt, which we were talking about today in Sabbath school, what I, um, and redeemed you from your slavery. I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam to help you. Do you not remember, my people, how King Balak of Moses tried to, uh, tried to have you cursed, and how Balaam, the son of Beor, blessed you instead? Such a funny story. And remember your journey to Gilgal. When I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you of my faithfulness. Hmm. Right? And that was the main point of our youth Sabbath school this morning. We were studying the plagues and how the whole purpose of that was to show that there is one God that was greater than all the gods. One God that could truly offer freedom to this people. And here God is asking them to remember that. Remember what I have done for you. Because we haven't really experienced the same depth of God's power in our lives. But is, isn't, that, isn't that what we call people to, to think about? Uh, as an Adventist church, I think we call them to think about the God of creation. That is the powerful God that made everything. Yeah. I, 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 I'm thinking of Revelation 14, 7. Fear God. Which, which God? The God who this, created the heavens and the earth, the same this, parallel. This God, this God here that's talked about in Micah, too. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just feel the same way. In so much of my life, I've often forgotten, and I need to constantly go back and remember what God has done for us in our lives, in, in my life and the lives before us. And so then he goes on, and he's almost asking this, 
kind of rhetorical question, and we can see that in verse 6. What can I bring the Lord? What should I bring him? Burnt offerings? Should I bow before the God most high with the offerings of my yearly calves? Should we offer a thousand rams or 10,000 rivers of olive oil? You see how it's kind of getting bigger and bigger and bigger? It's like there's never enough that you can do to earn God's favor, right? The price is too high. Um, we should, uh, should we sacrifice our firstborn child to pay for our sins? And here was that religion of the, the pagan people around them that they had actually picked up, and it's just so terrible. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's this growth of, what should I do? I'll do this, maybe I'll do this, and maybe, maybe eventually I can earn God's favor by buying my salvation, by buying my freedom. And then we get to the famous verse there, verse 6. Uh, no, sorry, verse 8, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Know, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. And here we have the list, the three things that he asks. To love mercy, oh, act justly, love mercy, and walk, walk humbly with your God. And it's just that simple. After we get past the list of trying to earn it all, he's like, this is all I want. This is all it is. So what is it? Do justice. You've heard me talk about the time when Israel decided that they wanted to be like the nations all around them. Well, here's a text coming right out of Micah that infers that should, is this the kind of relationship that God wants with us? Uh, The kind of relationship that the other nations who worship other gods or who Let's just, let's just be a little more generous. Might have a different way of thinking about God. d said it exactly right. It, it, it really is the two categories. You can separate the gods of this world and the God of creation into. The God of creation says, I will do this for you. And, and it, it will be totally my strength and my doing. And, and the, the other gods of the world say, you have to earn it. Do you see, the, do you see the, 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 the difference between those two? So if there's anything in your God concept, even the God of creation, if you have the attitude towards him that you have to earn his love, you might want to check on your God concept. You might want to check on what the Bible is saying about this because here's a litany of things that they believe might have to, that they might have to do. Should we even give our children? We just had children's story up here. Thank you very much. That was a lovely children's story. Should we give our children? This is a horrible thing to say. Are we giving our children? in the way that we do life in this 21st century, are we giving our children to God or giving our children to this world? It's a huge question that us as parents have to answer. And, and the kids today, they need to understand that maybe their forefathers did not honor God and might need, they might need to check on what has happened in the past and see where, whether or not it's the way that God would like us to continue going in the future. So when the question is asked, what should we do? Here comes the answer, and it's this threefold answer. Do justice. Do justly. So when we were discussing this, uh, I said... This, this, is ob- this is obviously an opportunity to say Israel decided they wanted a king. They wanted something like everybody else had. And what did it get them? It got them exactly what God said it would get them. The king would tax them. The king would take their young men off into battle and they would die. 
You wanted a king. You wanted to live. You wanted that system. You wanted that, that, that government in some respect. You didn't want a personal relationship with me. I love God. You know one of the reasons that I love him the most? Because he is the righteous judge. Why is he the righteous judge? Anyone have, have the same inspiration that I have? Why do you think he is righteous more than us in his judgments? Thank you, Joseph. He knows everything. So when we make judgments, we do the best we can, right? Isn't that, isn't that why, well, I don't know about you, but isn't that why I have decided, it is why I have decided, I cannot judge any of you or anyone else. I, I can't do it. I am just not qualified because I don't know everything. So if we're going to do justice and we're going to do it according to the God of heaven, then we may want to make a decision not to be the judge. Would that be fair? And that we would do justice according to his righteousness and his knowledge and his understanding, which is definitely not the basis for the ethics by which we live in this modern world. Are we agreed on that? Amen. So it's, it's kind of tough to remind us all about that, that as we walk out these doors into our lives, we are going into a system that is not interested in living life the way that we want to live it, or living life the way that God has asked us to live it, to do justly, to do justice. I don't know if, if that ever came up in your discussions with your kids. Mm -hmm. And Go ahead. Well, the question that we were mainly asking is, what does it mean for us to live justly and do justice here on earth, this earth? Okay. So what do, does it do, mean? Okay, what she's asking, she's, she's the teacher today, <laughs> and she's, she's asking you, so I'll, I'll facilitate. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Could give to, give to the poor. Um, I, that, that one is, is, is wonderfully nebulous. It's wonderfully nebulous. Okay? I, I, could, I could say give, okay, and I, then I could say what? And how much? And who defines who's poor? Okay, poorer than me. Could it, could it be, I, I'm going to use Ellen. We often talk about Ellen, and that's Ellen G. Okay, she's, she's my cool girl. And she says, do what is at hand. Do what's close beside you. So, yes, uh, last night I read, I read the update on Adventist Frontier Missions. And, uh, and uh, I, I should share that with you. I have the letter from Adventist Frontier Missions. Adventist Frontier Missions does things far across the sea. And they need our help. And there are missionaries that... I'm not there. I live in Santa Clarita. I'm asked to do what is close to me. Friends, right now in our congregation, a bunch of us are caring for a bunch of the rest of us. That is what is at hand for us right now. And as that attitude continues, it ripples out and we become aware of other people who may need our help and, and ways in which we can help them. The principle of what you said, ma'am, is, is absolutely right. Sister, you're, you're correct. We should help the poor. What if it's me? What if I'm poor in something that you can help me with? See, what's, what's your definition of poor? Because we've got to be careful about our American up-by-your-own-bootstraps attitude, yeah? You're saying, what, Pastor? What? That's the, that's the American way. Up by my own bootstraps. We're in California for Pete's sake. Sorry, Pete. Okay. The point is this. America and or California didn't become great just because of one person. It became great because there were people who helped each other. Yeah? 
That's, that's the great America that I love, mm. is when something happens, some disaster happens, and out of the woodwork come good people who say, let me lend you a hand. Here's my coat. Here's my car. Here's my house. You don't have a house. Let me help you. Look what's happened to the people in paradise. Do you have any update for us? I mean, are any, is anybody living in your area now that wasn't living in your area that came from paradise? Not so much. They're mostly sticking to the Yuba City, Chico area. Okay. Um, but I know like a lot of people in the area donated their RVs. And so they have like RV camps for people. We do have a group that's actually there right now, like setting up and doing stuff. Okay. That's, that's, that's helping. That's helping the people in need. Um, and I know that we live very, very busy lives. I know we do. But I do believe that there are times and places when we can be of assistance. Um, my wife and I had a, a fun little argument the other day. Um, we were in line to go around a corner and there were some people that were blocking the turn lane that could easily have uh, allowed us to continue on around the corner. <laughs> this, was a very, this was a very perfect example. There was another lady who wanted to come out. I waited literally one, two, three seconds and I let her out into the traffic. And then I went on, and I went around the corner, and the guy that was the big truck behind me comes zooming around me, and out of the passenger window comes an arm that's extended that had a phalange, uh, the middle phalange extended to show me his sentiment about making him wait three seconds longer. Now, Chris was of the opinion that uh, I should not have held them up because it was wrong of her to ask to go in there at that time. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, an opinion. I decided to try a social experiment that, because I usually would have just gone on myself too. I agreed with Chris. But I'd waited three seconds. <laughs> three seconds. And you could say that that was doing justice. I don't know. You, you decide. You decide. Next time you're in traffic, and you have an opportunity. I, I know Barry's shaking his head because he's got that truck to drive, right? <laughs> and he's hoping there's going to be somebody who's, who's going to be generous with him and that truck so that he doesn't have any scrapes when he comes home. <laughs> Do justly, yes. Well, I just think that just goes to show how simple just living, not even show loving, so it's, it's kind of threefold. Do justly and love mercy, right? Yes. But how it is at hand. It's what's in your hand. That's right. Um, one of my friends is a pastor in London, um, London, England. And he came and spoke at something we did up at Foothills Camp in Alberta, Canada. And he told this sermon. And the topic of it was, what is in your hand? What's in your hands? And we look at Moses. And God says to Moses, what's in your hands? And he's like, ah, this stick. He says, throw it down. Give it to me. Throws it down. It's, because, it's a snake. Right? He says, pick it back up. Mm -hmm. Go do that in front of others. Right? And he tells us a story about a young man. He's probably about 25, 26. And his gift is basketball. He just loves basketball. And so this young man in England has started a basketball, pick up basketball every day at this outdoor court where they just play basketball together. And this group of people that play basketball together, it's so cool because it's just something we wouldn't think, but it created community. And that community created opportunity to develop relationships where they could support people and get to know their needs. And as a result, they've started a church that's focused primarily around a bunch of people playing basketball. Anyone in? There's a pickup game? No. <laughs> there is a hike this afternoon. Thank you, Jason. There is a hike this afternoon. And guess what? If you would like to hike with your neighbor, call them up and saying, I'm going hiking this afternoon. Come with. There's still time. And I tell you what, this pastor will even pay for their pizza. Why would we do that? except to create these kinds of opportunities. Then we too can be a cool church that says, we go hiking and have pizza with our friends. Is that not right? Amen. 
Would that, would that not be one of the reasons why we go hiking and have pizza? Or are we just hungry for pizza? Sorry, I shouldn't talk about that. It's close to lunch. <laughs> Do justice, love mercy. She brought up a very, and I want, to, want you to talk about this, D-Ray. Um, uh, how, how can we do justice and love mercy? You ever ask yourself that? You want to do the right thing, but you've also got to love mercy. What does that look like? Well, when we look at what God's form of justice is, it's not necessarily our form of justice. Ooh. Right? Ooh. A lot of the times when we look at justice, justice is from a punishment point of view. You did this, so you get punished. And, and that works. That's the way we do it here in a nation, as a nation. Mm -hmm. But when God talks about justice, there is always restoration for the one that is harmed. And his focus is constantly restoration. Right? And that's the whole point of salvation. So when we do justice, restoration should be also the focus. And when restoration is our focus, then we are also loving mercy, right? Mm -hmm. God is just, but he's also restoring us and showing us mercy. And that mercy is our salvation. Can't help it. Matthew 18, help me with it. You've got a problem with somebody. Who gets to go to talk to that somebody that you have a problem with? You. Okay, so you're talking to that person. Why are you talking with that person? Okay, now she, she primed it, and, and therefore it's not fair. Because I grew up in a church that said you talk to that person because you thought that they had done something wrong and they were in jeopardy of losing their soul. And then if they didn't listen, what's step two in Matthew 18? Bring someone with you. Why were you going to bring somebody with you? Because they had a baseball bat that you didn't have and you were... Because we're going to beat these people into submission, right? Believe me, I'm growing up in a church where this is happening and it's not until my later years now when I read the message by Eugene Peterson, the Bible, written in his own words. God rest him, he died last year. That I found out that step three, what's step three? They haven't listened to you. They haven't listened to the group. What's step three? Tell it to the church. Now, we're going to tell it to the church so that everybody knows your sins. And they're going to know how bad you are. Okay, because step four is coming. And what's step four? Treat them as a pagan, the Bible says. You're not part of this group. Get out. Now, I'm just here to tell you that if D-Ray is right and that God's idea is not, if God's idea of justice is that it must be mixed with mercy and therefore it's restorative, it really should go a lot more like Eugene helped me to understand. You've got somebody who has just gone over a cliff. They're hanging on by their, their fingernails, okay? And you have gone down there and you've grabbed a hold of them. They are too heavy for you to pull back. What do you do? Help! And you get two or three more people to come and help you because what is your goal here? To save them and pull them to safety. And good, two or three don't work. So you call the whole church to help. Bring this person back. And if they still are saying, hey, just let me go, just let me go. What do you realize about them? They've given up on themselves. They've given up on themselves and they've given up on God. So what do they need? They need to be treated like a pagan. What's a pagan? A pagan is somebody who doesn't know Jesus. A pagan is somebody who's never heard that he loves you and that he would like to bring you back and restore you. They obviously have never heard the gospel. Eugene helped me to understand that step four is that these individuals need a gospel presentation. That's what it means to be a pagan to a Christian. You're an opportunity for me to tell you about the love of Jesus. Not 
to, to bar you from the door because you're a pagan, but to tell you Jesus loves you, died to save you, wants to bring you back home. That's step four. I need to tell you that again because one person did it, three people did it, and then a whole church did it, and you still didn't understand. I've got to call in the Holy Spirit to tell you of Jesus' love because it's about restoration. Did your kids get that from you, D-Ray? I don't know. What do you think, Emily? <laughs> Emily's smiling. I hope so. She's absolutely right. This is how we mix justice and mercy. We mix it the way that God mixes it, and it's called, it's called restoration. And that's what he's trying to do with every last single one of us in, in this church and in the whole world. But then there's the one last one, and we've got to, we've got to finish it. The walk humbly with God? Yes. So what does that one look like? Well, Mr. Pathfinder is here. Richard, Jill's doing so much better. We're praising God for that. Please give her our love. There she is. Jill, raise your hand. There she is. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Pathfinder Pledge and Law. Now, not all of you have been Pathfinders. I'll be a servant of God and a friend to man. Have you ever thought about what you're going to do with eternity? What on earth? It's going to be on earth, right? We believe that God's going to recreate the earth and he's going to bring his kingdom right here, the headquarters of his kingdom. That's what we preach, right? What happens next for the next hundred millennia? Thank you. I would put it to you simply that now is the time to become accustomed to being walking humbly with your God because that, my friends, is what we are going to do forever. If it doesn't fit now, if the yoke that Jesus puts upon you chafes and is like you're wanting to get rid of it because you want the, the, the pride is, is just bursting out of you, please pray today that God will bring about a change in your life and that you will know that we bow in his presence and that that is what we will be doing forever and ever. And that he is wanting to give us the desires of our hearts. And if the desire of your heart is to be his servant, there is no time like the present than to begin going on God's errands. I believe that's what it means to be a servant of God and a friend to man. Pathfinders teaches that. We teach that. D. Ray, you've been teaching that up in Pine Hills. Last words. What do you want to tell this congregation? Well, I'm just thinking about what it means to walk humbly with God. And I think that's just a reminder to what we just read in Micah. That you're not walking, walking humbly if you're trying to earn it all for offering your olive oil, your ram, your child. To walk humbly is to recognize that you're incapable of earning it, but being thankful that he's offering it. Amen. I think that's what it comes down to. It's really tough. I don't know about you, but it's really tough as a broad-shouldered American to realize that the way into the kingdom of heaven is to admit that I can't. We are a can-do people. But this is one that we can't do. This is one where we have to trust that he can and that he has. And to humbly accept his salvation and then to walk with him and ask him whatever it is that he wants us to do. 
to be part of that kingdom. Amen? Amen. Thank you, D-Ray. Thank you, Pine Hills Academy. Uh, we look forward to what's next for you. Thank you.